Thank you, Chris. Thank you in the name of the Brazilian people for this opportunity we have here to speak up, to say what is going on in Brazil more freely than we can do in our own country, unfortunately. Thank you, America, for the long-standing relationship with Brazil. The United States of America is the largest democracy in the Americas. Brazil is the second largest, or used to be. We all know that democracy is an ongoing process. While freedom, as Ronald Reagan once said, is not passed on to our children in the bloodstream, it must be fought for, protected and handed on for them to do the same. This is why we are here, to fight for our freedoms and to call to the world's attention the severe setbacks we are experiencing today in Brazil's democracy, freedom and rule of law. When I first arrived in Washington, D.C. 15 years ago to study at Georgetown University, and I'm very proud of that, I looked at Latin America and saw how socialism was subverting countries that were once democracies. Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. While those countries were succumbing to tyrants like Hugo Chavez and other puppets, of Fidel Castro, and while their people were losing their freedoms, Brazil remained democratic despite the country's historical institutional flaws and endemic corruption. That was the year 2009. Throughout the decade of 2010, Brazil entered a new era in which I was very optimistic. We all were. It was a period of time when millions of concerned citizens took to the streets to protest widespread corruption pervading our country's leadership. Operation Car Wash brought these issues to justice and put dozens of businessmen, public servants and politicians behind bars for money laundering and corruption, including the then former president Lula da Silva. He was found guilty as charged in three instances and sent to jail to serve a nine-year sentence. Not only in Brazil, by the way, but also Peru, Guatemala and Panama had presidents convicted by corruption in their countries because of the investigations that started in Brazil involving transnational companies that also operated abroad. However, in the beginning of 2019, Operation Car Wash began investigating another branch of power in Brazil, the judiciary. Whistleblowers exposed bribing schemes in the justice system all the way to the Supreme Court. When the story was published in the media, all hell broke loose. The Supreme Court's president at the time, Gia Stoffoli, an alleged participant in the bribing scheme, decided to censor Cruzoe magazine and opened an investigation, accusing them of, of spreading fake news. Justice Stoffoli appointed Justice Alexandre de Moraes to become the rapporteur judge of the case. The investigation, actually an inquisition, has the Supreme Court as an alleged victim, investigator, and judge at the same time. It is still open five years later and has been weaponized to persecute anyone whom the court itself understands to be criticizing it or opposing the views of its members. The number of people criminally prosecuted, or should I say more accurately, persecuted, by Justice Moraes and the court abound to thousands of Brazilians right now. Some of those here, some of those can't return to the country. From ordinary citizens to members of parliament, including the leader of the opposition, as just mentioned by my colleague, Gustavo Geyer, journalists, opinion makers, and even judges. We have a judge right here that also asked for political asylum in the United States and is living here right now. From a homeless individual who was just absolved by Mr. Moraes after serving a lengthy prison sentence for being at the January 8th event by chance to the former president of the Republic, Bolsonaro. Nobody escapes the rage and unconstitutional acts and decisions of the court. Assets frozen illegally, bank accounts secretly breached with no due process, passports taken, censorship, even torture. This is the case of Mr. Clériston Pereira da Cunha, known in Brazil as Clézão, who died in prison after spending 11 months in poor health conditions behind bars, including two and a half months after an order for his release that was signed by the general prosecutor, but it was ignored by Mr. Alexandre de Moraes. On the other hand, the convictions of corrupt politicians are being annulled by the Supreme Court, as was the case of Lula, who was released from jail and allowed to campaign for the presidency again by a Supreme Court decision contrary to the ruling of the lower courts. Businesses that were fined for their bribing schemes are being absolved too, and the fines are being cancelled by the same court. What we are experiencing in Brazil right now is a developing dictatorship. It is therefore not surprising that Lula da Silva's biggest allies are dictators, such as Venezuela's Maduro, China's Xi Jinping, and Russia's Vladimir Putin. And Hamas. Even the terrorist group Hamas sent congratulations to Lula as he returned to power and is now congratulating Lula on his absurd remarks towards Jews and the state of Israel comparing the legitimate defense acts of Israel to the Holocaust in Germany's Hitler in Hitler's Germany, sorry. Different than other dictatorships, however, the one we are seeing in Brazil is built in a more subtle and dangerous way. The judicial system itself is leading the institutional rupture, which makes it more difficult for the world to understand this sad and dangerous process. People tend to trust judges more than they tend to, to trust politicians. In Brazil, however, trust in the Supreme Court has fallen dramatically. 
A recent poll by Atlas Intel shows that more than 50% of the population has lost completely the trust in the courts, corroborating the feeling that the decisions of the Supreme Court are rather political than legal, constitutional, or just. I repeat, Mr. Congressman, our goal here is to make the situation well known to the world. We love our country. We love Brazil. We love the United States of America. We love freedom and we love democracy. And we understand that these virtues are only possible where there is strong rule of law. 15 years after living in the city of Washington, D.C., as a student, I look back to my own country, now as a member of Congress, with maybe a more realistic view, if not sad. This very opportunity that you give us, however, to share this message with you, with the American people and with all the world, renews our optimism and hope. As much as we love America, none of us want to live in another country. We want to live in another Brazil. God bless America. God bless Brazil. God bless you all. Thank you so much.